It is rather the degree to which a text manifests the phenomenon of novelness, romanus, that is the subject of his study. He says, every novel is a dialogized system made up of the images of languages, styles, and consciousnesses that are concrete and inseparable from language. And this is, now, this is what's important. Language in the novel represents, but it itself serves as the object also of representation. This is an aspect of Bakhtin's theory that explains the importance of quasi-direct speech or Stil and Direct Lieb, free and direct discourse, and Aleph Dorada as a formal feature of novelistic prose. But more to the point for our purposes, novelness is a particular take on language use. It is a function of what Bakhtin calls his metalinguistics. He said, diverse voices enter the novel and organize themselves within it into a structured system. This constitutes the distinguishing feature of the novel as a genre, he says. The variety of the uses to which humans have put language is the means Bakhtin chooses to study the history of consciousness understood as self-consciousness. Novelness, the medium in which language represents but itself serves as the object of representation, is a research tool for studying the paradox that dialogue is always trilogic. In this sense, Bakhtin is diamet diametrically opposed to the Russian formalist contention that poetry is the most complex uh, manifestation of, of, of language. Um, insofar as the novel is the genre that most obsesses dialogue, it may claim, he argues, to being even more deeply formalized in its use of language, insofar as it is a reflection on the formal nature of language itself. That is, dialogue does two things at once. It speaks and at the same time meditates what is said. However, in order for the duality of its event to be perceived as a simultaneity, it requires a third point of view that can perceive the event of representation in both cases. While also, and at the same time, perceiving the difference between the act of language representing and language as it itself is the thing represented, uh, we can see uh, a, a, a dialogue at, at work that uh, had it a deity, would not be, as has often been said, Janus, with two faces, but rather Hecate, the Greek titan known as to the Romans as Trivia, uh, and who presided over three-way crossroads. The novel, when it is noveling, is in this etymological sense trivial. It articulates the asymmetrical Simultaneity of different subjects, it is the form that more than any other insists on staging both the recursive nature of intersubjectivity, the continuity that joins an act, actual once a current being, with its representation, whether in thought or in a text. And at the same time, it forefronts the distance that separates these multiple manifestations of simultaneity. Now, obviously, Bakhtin's novelness is a category being asked to carry a very big load. And in concluding, really concluding now, I'd like to set out for discussion some of the reasons why such weight may be justified. If not as a poetics or aesthetics, then as a conceptual tool for better understanding new threats to the dignity of individual persons that uh, have arisen since Bakhtin's work on the novel was published in the last century. The power of numbers continues to find increasingly broader applications in a variety of technologies. And in so doing, the consequences of the 17th century stochastic revolution, originally seen as a liberating force against repressive theologies, becomes more ambiguous. The digital revolution, in the midst of which we find ourselves, has created conditions that empower mathematics in ways undreamt in the past. Its new immensity has created a fresh need to rethink 
traditional needs for domesticating mathematics. In so doing, that revolution has made the human aspect of the human use of numbers a new battleground for the age-old contest between freedom and necessity. There's a new urgency that haunts ancient questions about necessity versus free will. And I'm going to skip to the point where I say one of the more formulaic ways in which this dilemma has been uh, approached since 1789 at least is in the use by various political activists and novelists of the figure, the trope of two times two equals five. The political aspect of the equation that has become a recurring rhetorical trope was first demonstrated in modern times by Abbe C.S. 1789 pamphlet, What Then Is the Third Estate, in which he exploited the statistical and thus undemocratic imbalance between the mass of the population and the very small minority of the two other state, estates. It was surely this use Victor Hugo had in mind when he employed the trope in his polemic Napoleon le Petit to challenge the voting that had brought Napoleon to power. And, and, and that, it was, he was voted to be emperor. Uh, uh, the, um, its most famous use in the 20th century, of course, is, is uh, Orwell's 1984, just before Winston Smith finally has been tortured to the point where he has won victory over himself. He uh, has come to love Big Brother. He finds himself unconsciously tracing in the dust two times two equals five. Now virtually all of the citations I've made and many others that might have been referenced, by the way, there are dissertations that could be written on two times two equals five. Um, um, in all of them, however, what you get is the, uh, a, a negative sense of two times two equals five. Two times two equals four is the good thing. It represents order, it represents reason, and two times two is, is unreason, it's, it's bad. Now, it, keep that in mind because Dostoevsky's use of the figure two times two equals five in Notes from the Underground is unique then in this company. The underground man attacks the order of two times two equals four. He celebrates two times two equals five as the ultimate symbol of freedom, the ultimate democracy of all humans whose lust to make decisions for themselves is greater than the sheer order guaranteed by the system of numbers. In other words, he's demonstrating the negative capability of what Bakhtin calls novelness, a concept ultimately based on, as I said, Bakhtin's metalinguistics, uh, a view of language used originating in the twin assumptions that nothing is in itself and that there is no last word. As Beckett's Murphy puts it very well, in the beginning was the pun. It is no doubt fortuitous that the psychologist Daniel Kahneman, of uh, 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 immense fame now, chooses the letter K as a problem in one of his more outre experiments demonstrating what small role reasoning plays in most of our decision making. But in doing so, he reminds us that it is not now psychologists or statisticians, or perhaps least of all economists, who have most to tell us about the role of number in human decision making, but rather the novel, obsessed throughout its history as it has been with questions of how to confront the gap between freedom and necessity, liberty versus laws, child versus the individual, two times two equals four versus two times two equals five. So it is not surprising that a novel about the law should provide one of the best examples of novelness we have. I'm referring, of course, to Kafka's The Trial, whose hero, called simply K, explores necessity as a fiction in his attempt to grasp the meaning of the parable before the law. In that allegory, you remember, a man waits his whole life seeking admittance to the law, but is kept from going through the law's open door by a gatekeeper. And just before the man dies, he asks the gatekeeper why, during all the time he's been at the door, 
no one except himself. 